Okay, Deb, I'm not seeing anybody else join, okay. so why don't you? All right, then. Okay, so hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Deb Clinton, and I'm the Mo Money Communication Specialist, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this presentation today. So uh, first off, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement that um, uh, virtually this session is delivered from my home in Hamilton on land very close to Mohawk College. So I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that my home and the college are situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Ashinaabe uh, nations within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement and is currently home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. So it's important for me as a settler to this land to not only acknowledge uh, my privilege, but also to work towards deepening my understanding of these agreements and the Indigenous experience of Canada. I offer this land acknowledgement as a small act of reconciliation, but I'd also like to include a call to action. So what is Mo Money, right? So Mo Money is part of the Financial Assistance Department. Mo Money is a student money management center focused on two goals. Uh, one is to help students develop critical financial skills. And the other is to provide students with the resources and training to use those skills. So to accomplish these goals, we offer one-on-one -on -one money counseling uh, because money is definitely worth talking about. And if you have any questions or want to discuss your specific financial situation, you can book an appointment with our money counselor. So this is a free confidential and personalized um, meeting uh, where you can we'll learn about money management skills, such as setting financial goals, creating and sticking to a budget, establishing an emergency fund, managing debt and creating a savings plan. So we're here to help. And we have many ways that you can get involved with Mo Money. So here are some of them. You can follow us on social media and our handles are Mo Money underscore Mohawk for, for Instagram. And the other is uh, at Mohawk College Financial Assistance, which is Facebook. Um, as we said, Money Matters module is a free course that students can access on my Canvas. And you can also book an appointment with our money counselor. So to learn more, um, you can uh, visit our website um, and uh, you can find out about you know, what we do. So in addition to learning new skills and information to better understand and manage your finances, now and in, in the future, you uh, will be able to add this session to your co-curricular record. The co-curricular record is a tool for students to track experience or any program or event that's not formally related to your program of study. The CCR can be used on and off campus when applying for jobs, awards, and scholarships and to build resumes. So you need to register your attendance and we will leave you a link in the chat for that registration. So you need to enter the code Mo Money for me at, and I think Lindsay's going to uh, post that uh, link, or we'll post that link in the chat later. So um, I'm going to leave this up to Lindsay, and Lindsay's going to join us, and then she'll uh, let you know. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Diamond from the Mohawk College Alumni Relations Department. I am excited to be here. My pronouns are she and her. Um, so welcome everyone, students and grads who might be joining us. So just a little bit about alumni. Um, alumni is a great resource for once you graduate from the college. Um, we kind of take care of you after. Um, and then also for current students, we host a lot of events such as um, webinars like today's where we've partnered with Mo Money on Campus. We partner with other departments um, to provide a wide variety of events that um, are open to students as well as recent grads. Um, so I encourage everyone to start following us on social media. So we're on Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and also check out our website. So on to our feature presentation. I'd like to pass uh, the microphone over to Monica, our student facilitator. Um, so just give me a moment and I'll pass it over. All right, 
Over to you, Monica. Okay, so hello everybody. I want to welcome you to today's workshop. My name is Monica Fisher and I am a Health Office Administration student here at Mohawk College. I'm also a study skills tutor at the LSC. So I'm very pleased to be here today and I hope you enjoy our workshop. The Canadian Foundation for Economic Education is pleased to partner with the National Bank of Canada to provide a series of workshops to help post-secondary students across the country get a better, hand better handle on their money. Today's topic is how to pay for school and we'll dig into some strategies to pay for your education and how to look after the debt you'll take on afterwards. So this workshop will last about an hour and then we'll have a live Q&A session at the end. These workshops are intended to serve as a foundational resource to get you thinking about your finances, not as a final stop in your financial journey. So we want you to consider the information and see how you can apply the concepts covered to your, covered to your personal financial situation. Also, please understand that while we do our best to answer all related questions, we will not be discussing topics beyond the scope of today's conversation. If you have specific questions that we are unable to address, consider setting up an appointment with a financial professional. I also want to remind you guys that we sent a free survey. We hope you completed it. And there will also be a post survey sent at the end of the session. If you fill out both, you will be entered into a draw to win one of four $50 gift cards. And don't worry, we won't use your email address for anything else other than for the purpose of the show. Okay, so the CFEE and the National Bank have partnered to offer post-secondary students across the country access to important financial literacy workshops. The program Help Managing Your Money on Campus is designed to help support young people like you by providing you with comprehensive financial education modules. This is very important and timely because more than ever, we live in a complex financial world. The majority of you have likely already experienced this. Um, there's lots of responsibilities, planning, spending, debt, credit cards, and much more. So that's exactly why we've partnered with universities and colleges across the country to help equip students with the information they need to take on all of life's financial challenges. So in the first half of 2020, we asked students about their priorities and what they want to learn more about. Nearly 1,500 students answered our survey from 94 different post-secondary institutions, and this is what we found out. 53% of students said one of their top challenges was paying for school. 64% of respondents said they wanted to learn more about how to deal with financial stress. And then 55% of respondents want to build a financially healthy life. So today we're going to talk about three major topics. First, we'll discuss how to pay for your education. There are many ways to do so some of which include free money from the government, uh, other businesses, and there's other ways that we can help support you. Next, we'll look at some specifics about government student loans and provincial, provincial loan programs like the Ontario Student Assistance Program, or as most people know it as OSAP. Finally, we want, to take you, we want to talk to you about students and credit and what a score is and how student loans can affect your score and how you can improve it. Coming out of this workshop, you will have a better understanding on various programs available to help you pay for your education, including how to pay off student loan debt. You'll understand when and how you will have to pay back your student loans, and you'll appreciate the impact of student loans on your credit score and how you can manage it. The first topic we will be discussing is how to pay for school. So let's get started. Here's what we're going to cover in this section. Now, I'm sure we don't need to tell you guys how expensive a post-secondary education is, but here's some interesting info from McLean's Magazine. So to determine the real price of an education in Canada, McLean's undertook a first ever survey of 23,384 undergraduate students to find out how they spend their money and how they save for an education. They found the average cost of a year of post-secondary education in Canada is $19,498.25. But for some students, the amount is significantly higher. A University of Toronto student living off campus can expect to spend $23,485 each year. The higher, this is the highest average um, in our survey. Second on the list was Ryerson at $23,066, followed by St. Mary's University in Halifax at $22,892. Meanwhile, students living at home and attending Shearbrook had the lowest cost for an education at just $4,284. We 
We also want to keep in mind that with house prices rising, rent is also rising. So that needs to be factored into our costs. According to Statistics, Statistics Canada, the average Canadian university graduate finishes school with more than $26,000 in student debt. Ouch. Let's look at many different ways you can pay for school. These include scholarships and grants, government student financial aid, savings from a tax-free savings account, provincial loan programs such as the Ontario Student Assistance Program, summer savings, and student lines of credit. It is important to understand how they all work so you can just determine the best way for you to pay for your studies. Now, of course, the best way to pay for school would be through free money. There are actually thousands of scholarships and grants available to students. You just have to go and uh, find them and apply to them. Most universities and colleges have bursaries and scholarships based on high school marks. So for example, Mohawk College, we've have, we have awarded um, over $3 million in scholarships and bursaries in the past year. Um, all full-time domestic and international students are encouraged to complete the financial assistance profile application each semester. Continuing education and part-time students can complete the continuing education part-time student awards application each semester. The winter 2023 financial assistance profile application will be open from December 1st to January 31st. So we encourage you to um, create your profile. So what is the difference between a scholarship and a bursary? A scholarship is awarded for academic achievements, while a bursary is awarded for, um, or it's a based on financial need. We will provide you with a resource sheet after this workshop that will point you in the right direction to find scholarships and bursaries that might be great for you. So each school is going to have a tool like this one. So what you're looking at, you're looking at the Mohawk College website. Um, so to get to this website, you simply just search for scholarships and bursaries, and then you will arrive at this page. And this is where you will find all of Mohawk scholarships, bursaries, and awards. So I encourage you all to check that website out. Next, um, banks, companies, foundations, and other enterprises also offer scholarships, bursaries, and grants. So I'm going to take you guys through three websites and um, they all offer um, awards and scholarships. Okay, so the first website is Scholarship Canada. Um, so you simply can search for a scholarship or you can browse the scholarships. Sorry, I'm just looking this way because I have another screen over here. So when you browse the scholarships, you can tailor them to uh, whatever scholarship you're looking for. So they have scholarships for art students, for black students, for grad students, um, business school students. So this is all something that's worth, um, that's worth checking out. The next one is Wyconic. So what you wanna do when you're on this website is go up here to student awards. So you'll click student awards. And then from here, you will see um, multiple different scholarships. This is something that you all could look through on your free time if you'd like. And then the last one is university study. University study does not allow you to apply to scholarships directly through their website. But what university study is great for is it's a great resource um, for students. So it has lots of information on how to uh, on scholarships and it also has information on international scholarships. Okay. All right, so preparing to apply. Scholarships and bursaries can make a significant difference in the co in costs you're required to cover for school. So it's important you take the application process very seriously. This is because hundreds, sometimes thousands of other students may be applying for the same scholarship that you are. So you need to make sure that you stand out from the crowd. So here are some tips to writing a strong scholarship application and getting noticed. First, you wanna practice writing an application, an essay to get your thoughts organized and know what you want to say. Then you want to identify your goals for your education and your future. These don't have to be set in stone, but it's important to understand why you're pursuing your education and how the scholarship will help you get there. Then you want to consider how your goals will affect your community. The best scholarship applications 
are not just how the money will help you, but it's about how it will eventually help others. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, you also want to proofread your application because silly errors can be a quick way to get taken out of the running. And lastly, don't reinvent the wheel, customize it. In many cases, you can reuse uh, long answer portions from one application to the next. If you do this, so you just want to make sure that you are customizing the information to reflect what the scholarship is about. So you meet all the criteria. So once you seek out and apply for free money, of course, you can also borrow. For government student financial aid, you have to apply six months before the program starts. Interest rates are typically lower than any other student debt, like a line of credit. You do not need to pay back the loan or interest while you are studying. Uh, once you have completed your studies, you, have, you don't have to start paying back your loans immediately. If you have a Canada student loan, you'll have a six month non-payment period after you graduate. During that period, you won't have to make payments and you won't be charged interest on your loan. The first six month non-repayment period starts after you do one of the following things. So either you finish your final school term, you transfer from full-time to part-time studies, you leave school or you take time off of school. So you have to apply to your provincial student aid offices. So we'll provide this link to you. Both part-time and full-time students can apply. The grant and loan amount depends on your province, your family income, dependents you may have. So the amount of children you have under the age of 18, tuition and living fees. And if you have a disability, you can apply at the Government of Canada website. Changes to the Canada student grants and loans were introduced so students facing financial challenges from COVID-19 can access and afford post-secondary education. So the doubling of the Canada student grant amounts is what happened. So in response to an increased need for the coming 2020 to 2021 school year and beyond, the maximum amount of Canada student grants will be doubled effective August, August 1st, 2020, and will be available until July, 2023. The Canada Student Grant for full-time students will also increase up to a maximum of $6,000. If you are um, a student with disabilities, this will increase to $10,000. And the grant for part-time students um, is increased to $3,600. The student grants for students with permanent disabilities and students with dependents will also be doubled. Another way to pay for school is a tax-free savings account. This is a government registered account that has no tax on interest, income, and withdrawals in the account. You can only contribute a limit set by the government. So for 2022, it is $6,000, but each, each year's limit is cumulative. So Canadian citizens who have been 18 since the program was launched could actually contribute up to $81,500. Another way to pay for school is through a registered education savings plan. So these are created by a parent or a guardian for the child. Contributions made into a child's RESP before they turn 15 years old are eligible for the Canada Education Savings Grant, where the federal government will match 20% of your contributions into the account, up to $500 per year. Unused grants can be carried forward to claim up to $1,000 in incentives per year. The Canada Learning Bond Adult Beneficiary Program is a new incentive starting January 1st, 2022, where individuals born in 2004 can apply for the CLB under their own name and potentially receive up to $2,000 in free money to help finance their education. This money must go into an RESP, so if you don't already have one, you will need to open one to be eligible. If your parents have previously opened an RESP in your name, it can be a great source of money for your education, as that's exactly what the account was made for. The money withdrawn from your RESP to pay for post-secondary education, or expenses, sorry, like tuition, books, transportation, those, these are all called educational assistant payments, and they are considered taxable income. These payments include the interest earned in the account, so CESG, CLB, and provincial grants. RESP withdrawals are also considered when applying for government student financial aid. And of course, another way to save for school is to earn it. So during your time off of school, you can gain part-time or full-time employment. A basic savings account is great for, for short-term savings. 
You can access your funds at any time with no maximum amount. In some banking apps, you can set up saving goals and this can help you save in periods of time. A student line of credit is an additional way to pay for school. During school, you don't need to repay while a full-time student. You need to repay interest each month. Um, oh, sorry, you don't need, you don't, you do not need to be repay interest each month while you're in school and you can reuse the credit at any time. After your studies, you must repay once you have a full-time job or one year after. Remember, interest is accumulating if you delay paying this back. The time you have to pay back the line of credit is based on how much you owe. And you want to make sure you understand how the agreement works. Um, you may be given a lump sum and then possibly be able to use a line of credit, line of credit if the bank allows it. So now this becomes a budgeting exercise. So you, you kind of want to figure out all of your costs and your expenses for school. You want to uh, distinguish what is variable, what is fixed. Are there any places that you can save money by say getting another roommate or sharing a car? You have to think about what sources of inflow or income do you have? Have you looked into all available scholarships and bursaries? So the bottom line is if you're short on money, you have to figure out how will you come up with it. Alrighty, so we have a little Zoom poll. Just bear with me while we figure out this info. My apologies, some technical issues. So unfortunately, the Zoom pool is not working, so we're just going to move on. Sorry about that. So here are key takeaways from this section. Post-secondary school is expensive, but it can be a valuable investment. There are many different avenues available to help you pay for your education, so it's important to have a plan in place to know how it will be covered. The, the second topic we'll be discussing today is about government student loans. Most students will have to borrow money to pay for school, even, it's, even if it's from the bank of mom and dad. So in this section, we're going to briefly talk about what government student loans are and how they help students. Then we'll look at some specifics about repaying student loans that are important to know even before you get to that point. Then we will look at strategies for managing your loan with both a high income and a low income and supports available if you can't afford to pay anything at all. So if you have a student loan, you are definitely not alone. According to Statistics Canada, across Canada, 82% of college graduates had loans from government sources. The 2018 National Graduate Survey collected information on individuals who graduated from a public post-secondary institution in Canada in 2015. Of all these 2015 post-secondary graduates who graduated with student loans, two thirds had not fully repaid it by 2018. In the same survey, average debt at graduation was $15,000. If you are like most graduates, you are, you are graduating with a student loan. This means that if you aren't already, you will become familiar with the National Student Loan Service Center or the NSLSC. It is important to keep your NSLSC account up to date and check it periodically to ensure everything is accurate. Your account will have information on both the federal and provincial loans you've received. You will be required to start repaying your loans six months after completing your full-time studies. This is true whether you finished your education or you've dropped down to part-time status. 
You will also not be charged interest while you are a full-time student, but once your status changes, um, that interest will begin to accumulate. One thing to note, students with an OSAP loan who are enrolled in a program or who are continuing full-time studies with a new OSAP loan will automatically maintain interest in status. If you have the means and the opportunity, you can start paying off your loan at any time. You don't have to wait. So if you receive some graduation money, um, if you find a summer or a permanent job right away, you could maybe consider putting some extra money on your student loan, especially if it's accumulating interest. The NSLSC will reach out to you via email before your six month non repayment period ends to prompt you to set up your loan payment options. It is great that you have loan repayment options as everyone's circumstances are different and having the flexibility to choose the payment approach that works for you can make it as easy as possible to pay back. As mentioned earlier, if you have the means at any time, you can put a lump sum down on your loan. This will reduce the amount owing and the interest that you will pay on it. Once you receive this prompt from the NSLSD, you will be able to choose how you make your payments how much you're going to pay each month. Is it going to be above the minimum? Is it going to be the minimum? And the date that you will make payments. Most people choose a date where they know that they will be getting paid or have sufficient funds in their bank account. So they don't have to worry about missing a payment. You will have to choose to have, you will have a choice to have payments automatically deducted from your bank account, or you can pay manually. Um, so transfer funds as a pay fee. Most people opt for the automatic deduction. This is just because it's the easiest way to not miss a payment. So um, you do need to ensure though that you have the monthly amount in your account. You can even arrange to have the payments calculated on a weekly or bi-weekly amount. This, pay, this helps you pay down the principal amount of the loan so you pay less interest overall. You can also choose whether to have a fixed interest rate or a floating interest rate. The NSLSC will be by default give you the floating interest rate if you do not specify which one you want. That doesn't necessarily mean though that that is the best option for you. A fixed interest rate is calculated to be the uh, prime rate set by the Bank of Canada plus 2%. So as of yesterday, I, I Googled what the prime rate was and I believe it was 5.95%. Um, the benefits of a fixed rate is that it's stable and it's predictable. A floating interest rate is equal to the prime rate the prime rate is subject to change by the Bank of Canada, so it can change monthly. A floating rate is considered a bit risky because it is subject to the economy and the factors that are beyond our control. You can start with the floating rate and change it to the fixed rate. However, once you change it to fixed, you cannot change it back. Okay, so in the wake of COVID-19, the federal government introduced 0% interest on federal student loans until March, 2023. This was an additional relief to new and recent graduates who were going through difficult times during the pandemic. If this uh, non-interest period continues past March, 2023, then maybe some of you will be able to benefit from it depending on when you graduate. Since each student's financial situation post-graduation is different, it can be hard to predict where we're going to work. It's gonna be hard to predict um, some tips to pay off your loan faster. Um, so we're gonna give you guys some resources for people who are struggling to make even the minimum payment. Paying your student loan off quickly starts while you're a student. By only taking the funding you actually need, not accepting the extra they may offer for extraneous costs. If you have financial needs, choosing the only grant option and paying the rest can be a great way to avoid accumulating student loans. Applying for as many bursaries and grants as possible is another way to get access to these additional funds though it's not always guaranteed. We wanna create a strict budget and avoid unnecessary expenses at all costs, including over the summer months. This will make it easier for you to build summer savings and for them to last into the year. You'll also wanna shop for sales whenever possible. So whether it be clothing, groceries, or you know, your phone and your internet plan. Once you enter repayment on your loan, make more than the monthly minimum payment to help cover the principal as quickly as possible and to avoid accumulating interest. So it is important to remember that like increasing your payments, you can also decrease them to suit your budget. So 
decreasing your payments will increase the amount of time it takes to pay off your loan and the total interest you accumulate. So decreasing is one thing, but you don't want to miss any payments. If you miss your loan payment for more than nine months, your loan falls into default and is transferred to the Canadian Revenue Agency. So if this happens, you are at risk of racking up heavy penalties and it will affect your credit score. The CRA is a federal agency and they do have the power to withhold your income tax refund, um, garnish your wages and seize your assets. This of course can also be, can also have a negative effect on applying for mortgages, credit cards, rental applications. So if you ever find yourself in a position that you are struggling to pay back your loan, there are options that I will explain in the next few slides. So there are several programs that the NSLSC offers that can extend your non-repayment period for an additional six months. So if you're an owner um, or joint owner of an eligible new business in Ontario, you can get an extra six months before you must, you can get, you can get an extra six months before you must start repaying your Ontario student loan or the Ontario portion of your Canadian Ontario integrated student loan issued through OSAP. Federal government loans issued through OSAP are not covered by this program. Um, you can also be eligible if you work 30 plus hours a week for a registered nonprofit. To be eligible, you must have left post-secondary education within the last six months and not currently be in repayment status on your loans. You also have to work 30 plus hours per week in a registered nonprofit or for, or for your eligible new business operating in Ontario. And you're gonna to have to complete the appropriate forms and application. So it'd be helpful to check out the OSAP website for more information or how to apply. Depending on your income or your disability status, there are also programs available to halt your payments entirely. In order to be eligible to this, um, in order to be eligible for the repayment assistance plan, your loan payments must exceed 20% of your total income. So you can apply any time during your repayment period. So if your income changes unexpectedly, you can still be eligible. You will work with the Bank of Canada and Ontario governments to find a payment approach that will work for you, including no payments. And in order to remain eligible, you must reapply every six months. In order to be eligible for uh, the repayment assistance plan, you must be a, can a Canadian resident and be up to date on your loan payments. The RAPPD process and eligibility is similar to RAP, but you need to submit medical assessments and demonstrate a permanent disability that impa impacts your ability to pay. So here are our key takeaways from this section. Whether, whether for better or worse, student loans are a common part of acquiring an education in Canada. You don't have to pay your student loans while you're in school, but once you leave full-time studies, there are many payment options available. And you wanna make sure you always pay on time. So if you're ever concerned you won't be able to pay, you wanna look into assistance plans before you miss any payments. And finally, we will look at specific considerations for students when it comes to credit score and credit management. In this section, we're going to briefly talk about what a credit score actually is and why it's important. And then we will look at how student loans can impact your credit score and how they differ from other forms of credit and debit. Finally, we will talk about a few ways students can build or improve their credit score. So what is a credit score? When you use credit, you will be building your credit score. It is important to have some borrowing history to ensure if you want to borrow for a larger purchase like a house or a car that, you, that your credit rating will be established and positive. Because your credit score is used by lenders to determine what kind of borrower you are, it can affect your eligibility for certain loans or credit cards, as well as the interest rate that you get. The credit score itself is a numerical summary of the information contained in your credit report at a particular point in time. If you have any credit accounts, such as credit cards, a mortgage or loans, you will likely have a credit report. So in Canada, your credit report ranges from 300 to 900, 900 being a perfect score. If you have a score between 780 and 900, that's excellent. If your score is between 700 and 780, that's considered a strong score and you shouldn't have too much trouble getting approved with a great rate. You may need a credit score of 750 to lease the car you want, but a prospective landlord may be fine with 650. It's all up to each lender to decide. Now, when you start hitting 625 and below, your score is getting a little low and you'll start finding it more and more difficult 
uh, to qualify for a loan and you will likely pay a higher interest rate. We, we don't want you to obsess over the exact number, but we want you to be aware of where your score fits into the ranges. Meeting future goals depends on your credit score. The two most important things that go into your credit score are number one, your payment history. So do you pay all your bills on time? Are you paying your cell phone, your Netflix, your hydro, your water, all on time? And the next one is credit utilization. So the amount of debt outstanding to total credit available. As a rule of thumb, you wanna try not to have more than 30% of credit limit outstanding at any one time. So if you have a $1,000 limit on your credit card, then it'd be wise to try not to have more than $300 outstanding at any one time. For the 10% piece of the pie for new credit inquiries, differentiate between these differentiate between a hard and soft credit check. So a hard check is when you authorize a lender to check your credit um, and uh, your rents, sorry. A hard, a hard check is when you authorize a lender to check your credit. Um, so like a mortgage has several of these within a month. Well, that, these will all just count as one inquiry. Your credit application, rent a property, your new cell phone, these all stay on your credit report for uh, two to three years. A soft check is when you get your free annual report. Um, a company inquires to see if you qualify for a credit card or an employer does a background check on you. That's all a soft check. So correcting past issues will take time. People looking to extend your credit will want to see 12 to 24 months of good behaviors. Paying on time for one month won't help you. It needs to be consistent. So you need to make it a habit. You can likely access your credit score on your banking app for free. So almost everyone here will have a credit score because as we said earlier, 82% of post-secondary students depend on government student loans, which are a type of borrowing. It can be alarming to watch your total student debt accumulate while you are still in school and not earning the money to make any payments. Some people may prefer not to look at all, but this isn't being an informed borrower. It's important to understand the money you owe for student loans. So when you graduate, you need to start paying them back. You aren't surprised by the amount. <laughs> To access information on your accumulated student loans, you can go to the National Student Loans Service Center, and like the website, and they will have information on your current balance owing, as well as the portions that are federal and provincial and what the respective interest rates are. Student, student loans can add up really quickly, but in the next few slides, we're going to look at how you can turn that to your advantage rather than being overwhelmed by it. While student loans do not, have to, do not have an impact on your credit score, that impact can be different from other types of debt. So first, when you're in school, you are accumulating student, lo student loans, which you are not required to pay back yet. This accumulated debt does show up on your credit score, but it only shows up as a way of showing how much debt you have outstanding. Unlike credit cards, there is no impact from not making payment, payments and no interest accumulated for carrying a balance. Once you enter repayment, student loans are considered installment loans, which means you are expected to pay the agreed upon amount on time every month until the loan is paid off. With a credit card, only paying the minimum can be a very bad way to get out of debt uh, just because of the monthly compounded interest. Installment loans like student loans, car loans, or a mortgage are instead based upon a specific contract to get a large purchase paid off in a set period of time. So making the agreed upon payments on time consistently will improve your credit score and there will be no negative impact from carrying a balance on the loan besides being charged with interest. Another advantage to installment loans is that they add to your credit mix. You may remember from the credit score pie chart that roughly 10% of your score is based on your available credit mix. So this is because borrowers want to see that you can manage different forms of credit well, not just a credit card. Having an installment loan as part of your, as part of your mix can positively impact your score and making your, uh, and making your payments on time will build a history of installment payments that could help when applying for different installment loans like a car loan or a mortgage. Finally, student loans, unlike other forms of debt, offer tax credits for the interest you pay on them, which can help decrease what you owe come tax time. Now that we know that everyone with student loans has credit, what are you doing to build or improve your credit score so that it's there for you when you need it? A great habit to get into reviewing your credit score so you know how your decisions are affecting it. 
There are a lot of ways to check your score for free, for free through different phone apps. Most banking apps have the option, um, as do apps like Credit Karma. These can be great resources to monitor your score, but be aware of the ads and other and offers for uh, credit cards. You, you don't wanna be applying for a rent of credit cards because this can hurt your score. Another way to get started improving your credit score is by getting access to a credit card and using it appropriately. Many banks will offer student credit cards with a $1,000 limit to people enrolled in a post-secondary institution as a way to improve your credit. If you do get a credit card, here are some tips to build your score. So you want to avoid keeping an average outstanding balance of more than 30% of your limit. So this means if your available credit is $1,000, you don't, uh, don't keep an average average of don't keep an average of more than $300 going. If you need to go over that, you can, but you want to, you want to, you want your average balance to be lower. Pay your card in full each month. Unlike installment loans, credit cards should be paid in full each month in order to avoid paying the extremely high interest rates. 20% annual interest compounded monthly can end up costing you a lot more, a lot more money than the initial, than the initial purchase price of an item. Paying your credit card in full and not carrying a balance will also help improve your credit score, and it is considered good behavior. Finally, make sure you pay all debts on time, including your student loans when they enter repayment. Because of their setup as an installment loan, student loans actually offer a great opportunity for students to work on improving their credit score as soon as they finish their education and potentially helping their chances of other significant purchases in the future, like a house or a car. So here are our takeaways from this section. Credit scores are, credit scores are very important um, to ensure you are eligible for large expenses in the future. Student loans can be a viable tool to build your credit score if you make payments on time. And credit cards can help build your credit score if you use them the right way. So let's review what we talked about today. So there's lots of costs for school, but it can be a great investment that pays off for your future self. There are a lot of ways to pay for school. Make sure you look to as many of them as possible and understand your costs and inflows to see if you can make any adjustments to be able to afford school. So here are our takeaways from this section. Whether for better or worse, student loans are a common part of acquiring an education in Canada. You don't have to pay your student loans while you're in school, but once you leave full-time studies, there are many payment options available. And make sure you always pay on time. If you are concerned you won't be able to pay, look into an assistance plan that before you miss any payments. Here are takeaways from students of credit. So credit scores are important to ensure you are eligible for large expenses in the future. Student loans can be a valuable tool to build your credit score if you make your payments on time and credit cards can also help you build your credit score if you use them the right way. Coming out of this workshop, you will have a better understanding on various programs available to help you pay for your education, including how to pay off student loan debt. Understand when and how you'll be able to pay back your student loans and appreciate the impact of student loans on your credit score and how you can manage it. So here are our next steps. We would like you to look into scholarships and bursaries, um, visit the NSLSC website and you know, check out more program resources and make a plan to pay off your credit card. So I want to thank you all for attending today. And I also want to remind you that we sent a free survey that we hope you completed. And there will also be a post survey sent at the end of the session. If you fill out both, you will be entered into a draw to win one of four $50 to foreign gift cards. And don't worry, we won't use your email address for any other reason except this draw. It is important that we ensure these workshops are providing you with the information you need. So please complete the survey if you can. So I open the floor up to any questions, if anybody has any.